According to the most recent research, 1 in 36 children in America have been diagnosed with autism. This number keeps on growing. Why is it happening? I have my thoughts. Let's talk about it. Hey everybody, it's Dr. David. So I know I've shared this story on the channel, I think once before a few years ago, but I think it's of interest now. Um, I have been a pediatrician now for, oh, it's been just about 25 years. And during my time at Tampa General Hospital, which is where I did my residency, my training, and this was back in the mid 90s, all of the residents were notified. Hey, there is a child who was admitted for asthma on the floor, but she has autism. Come see this child. You may never see one again. Now, of course, if that was only the case, okay? And back then, the numbers were probably about one in 500, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, and obviously, now we know it's almost impossible to walk through a mall or Disney World or somewhere else without identifying a person who is rather obviously does have autism. And of course, there are much higher functioning people who still have a diagnosis with autism that you wouldn't necessarily pick out in a crowd, okay? But this is something that has been changing and growing over time, and it's very upsetting. Now, what they did with this most recent CDC statistics is they looked, now they, they, they do the data collection for an eight-year, for eight-year-olds. OK, and so obviously when the child is born, they're looking at eight years to see if they have the diagnosis. Um, and it takes a couple of years for them to compile the data, um, sort it all out and to make the final conclusions. OK, so in their very first study that they did, which was back in 20 in 2000, the numbers were one in 150 children were being diagnosed with autism. OK, by 2029, so nine years later, that number went to one in 88. So that was an almost doubling of the numbers of autism. And people had lots of different ideas. Are we diagnosing better? Are we um, identifying problems earlier? Or were patients previously misdiagnosed? Cause you know, we don't use labels such as mentally retarded or other things like that before. Uh, it, like was used in past generations. And certainly many of those kids would now have that diagnosis. So there was a fair amount of question. Maybe they're just more aware of it. Okay, but then we fast forward to this most recent data in in 20 in 2020 showing that it's one in 36 that's more than a doubling since 29 2009 okay and we can no longer say it's because of better awareness and better diagnostic abilities because that hasn't changed awareness has been there for a long time autism speaks has been out there hammering the importance of early identification diagnosis the needs for school support and everything for a long time so that's still more than a doubling one in 36 that is an insanely sad number, okay? Now, um, as you may know, autism has been a passion of mine. Um, my the, Really the first um, um, condition that I really started focusing outside of the more general concept of, of holistic care, of, of healthy lifestyles, etc. And what happened was a, an, I had a child who came to my office. This is when I was down in Palm Beach County. And the mom said, hey, I've, I've heard about these tests that you can do, um, these treatments that you could do. Would you order them for me? Can we do go through them together? Of which I hadn't heard of um, these tests being used in that way before. But I figured, and this was originally part of my belief in medical freedom and parental choice, was to say, well, gee, if there's a test out there that can help your kid, of course I'll be able to do that. And this one kid happened to have had a yeast infection. We treated it and the kid did remarkably better. And that's kind of how things did get started in the first place. Now, in my opinion, though, there is multiple things that are going on here. First of all, we do know that there is a genetic component here. How do we know this? Because of incidents in families. If a, if a family has one child with autism, there is a one in eight or one in seven chance that they will have a second child with autism alone. Now, of course, there could be environmental there too, but we also know through the genetic testings, through um, our lookings through um, all of the genes, that they have identified multiple genes that, of course, are heritable and therefore shared within families um, that are associated with autism. But that doesn't, of course, mean that a person will develop autism. So I'm thinking of it that's there's kind of like a a bullet and a trigger kind of mechanisms that are going on here that there may be something in the chamber but something is being is activating something someone's pulling the trigger 
Something's happening that's making children develop autism at this alarming rate. Okay. Now, we know of what's called epigenetics. Epigenetics is when the things in our environment, in our gut, when we talk about the epigenetics of our microbiome, things that are happening locally that can impact both how we may replicate our, our genes, but also how our body reads the genes, how it expresses themselves, okay? And there's lots of things from toxins and nutrients and things that we have been identified. So um, one of the things, and all of the research that I'm going to be quoting, it's all in the show notes in the description down below the image here. So uh, you can look them all up and like kind of get a little more deeper meaning. Um, but, you know, levels of vitamin B1, B6, B12, vitamin A and vitamin D have all been reported to be lower in people with autism. And in fact, in 20, you know, so we know that there is this nutritional component. Um, you know, I also have found zinc to be a big player in this as well. Now, just a couple of years ago, not even about 15 months ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a report about autism. I want to quote what this says here. So what they said in several studies, researchers have found an association linking autism with air pollutants, pesticides, and phthalates, um, and that they're stronger among children of women who either did not take folic acid or who had higher folate requirements during pregnancy. Okay. They actually then went on to talk about MTHFR, and you've probably heard me talk about this before. MTHFR is the gene that codes for the messenger RNA that then codes for the enzyme called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase or MTHFR. So the enzyme is actually the same name. The protein is the same name as the gene, and its job is to activate folate. OK, so, of course, if one's not taking in a folic acid or folate in the first place, that's the problem. But also, if you have a gene that doesn't allow you to activate it to this active form, this methylfolate, then that's a problem, too. So when they're referring to higher folate requirements, that's also what they're talking about. And then right there in the paper, they do start um, quoting several studies related to MTHFR. OK, now. We now know that there is much more to the genetics than just MTHFR. There's old other genes related to folate metabolism. That's not that. But also the, meta the genetics of the metabolism of vitamin B12 and vitamin B6 that are also really important. And those are things that we check for on a regular basis. Now, these aren't things that I just check for, for uh, in including those nutritional deficiencies that I mentioned. They're not just things that I check when a person walks in the door with autism, although I clearly do that. This is something that I'm checking for, ideally preconception. You may have heard me talk about our preconception to infancy project. As soon as we can possibly identify any of these abnormalities, we want to correct them. We don't want to wait, but we feel having the most optimal um, uterus, the environment for the fetus to be developing, of course, breastfeeding, uh, nutrition of babies coming forward. You know, we've talked before about how they're finding lead and arsenic in baby food. Well, those heavy metals are also associated with um, with these types of issues. Um, and in fact, you know, even just this past week, so JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, they have a sub journal um, called JAMA Pediatrics. And what they did in this most recent study, I want to quote this to get the numbers right as well, was that they compared 8,842 8, kids with autism and 44,000, a little under, um, for controls based upon where they live. So geographically, and then they looked at, at, and and the moms who drank the, the city water, the tap water, because they know because they do testings of, of minerals and toxins and all types of things. And they found that women who were drinking water with the highest lithium level had a significantly higher chance of develop, having a child develop autism. Okay. Pesticides, Herbicides, we've all talked, you know, we've talked all about Roundup, um, glyphosate, um, have, have also been implicated. Um, and so, you know, we live in a toxic world. There are things that we could be doing, though, to minimize that toxicity. First and foremost, getting those genes that I was referring to before, getting the right forms of the B vitamins so that the body can I optimally deal with the toxins that we're going to be exposed to. Um, one of the labs that I worked with, I stopped testing for, is able to measure the glyphosate, the Roundup level in urine. 100% of people have it. They can't figure out what is a safe level. I stopped testing it for it because I'm like, well, you know, Obviously, eating organic is helpful, not spraying one's lawn with Roundup, but even people who are so clean, they're still testing positive. But of course, the minimum exposure, the better. Okay, so 
we have taken an approach of looking for root cause. And of course, root cause is genetics, but again, what are these, what's pulling the trigger, okay? And um, so we believe that although, for instance, a child with ADD um, or with autism who has ADD features may do better with Ritalin, we know that the root cause is not a Ritalin deficiency or a Prozac deficiency for the very anxious child, et cetera. But these medicines can be helpful, but if we can find the reason why, how much better would that be? Okay. So, you know, that's why I do check for all of those different types of nutrients, etc. Why we, you know, one of the things that we found super important and often messed up in our children with autism, as well as other chronic conditions, is the intestinal microbiome. Okay. We know that we get our first bacteria through our, when we pass through the GI, through the, mother, the maternal vaginal tract. And if the C-section happens, they can be missed out right away. And that's why we talk about giving the bacteria in those situations. Antibiotic exposure, steroid exposure, unhealthy foods, all of those things it dictate how are the levels of good guys compared to the bad guys in our gut. And that's why we do the types of testing to see if there's any there. We make those types of corrections. What we, so, um, you know, there's even more detailed nutrient testing. There's a, a micronutrient panel that looks at every single nutrient out there that can tell us if the intracellular levels inside the white blood cells, if they're low. And of course, we can correct all of that. Um, even in terms of toxic metals. Now, this is an interesting thing because when I, we first started doing this, this was 25 years ago. The most common metal that I would do when I would do what's called a provoked urine challenge, where we would give a chelation agent and it um, would then pull it out. We would do a pre versus post urine to see what showed up in the urine. Back when we were doing this 20 years ago, the primary, the primary metal that I was finding was mercury. Now, since then, mercury was removed from all the vaccines and parents, were, mothers were warned about not eating high mercury containing fish. Okay. Coincidence or not, I'll leave that to somebody else. But I will tell you that although I've continued to do the testing for heavy metals, it's very uncommon nowadays that I do see mercury. So do with that what you want. But also I recognize that the number of uh, that the incidence of autism has not gone down since the mercury was removed. Right. So it kind of couldn't all be that. What I am I finding more is a lot more lead. Right. And again, we know it's in the tainted food sources. We know it's in water supplies. We heard about the terrible situation up in Flint, Michigan, which was, of course, the extreme of it all. But we know that lead is 100 percent toxic to the brain. Right. That's terrible. People are being exposed. We know about the arsenic that is showing up in rice products, even organic rice products sometimes. Um, it's a problem. But we can test for these things. We can lower these things. We can minimize them. Another thing that we often check for are mycotoxins. These are toxins made by mold. OK, they themselves can have a terrible impact on the immune systems, on the brain, etc. A P test will tell us if they're high. It'll tell us which which organism is probably coming from. We can talk about home remediation. We can talk about binders and other ways of, of removing the, those toxins from the body. So, you know, despite this terrible news that we are seeing such a high incidence of autism, there is a silver lining that we do seem to be able to um, reduce the incidence. In our practice, we're looking at about one in 400 to one in 500 children of people who are born into our practice who are doing all of these things from the start. So that's like more than a 90% reduction in the incidence of autism in our practice. And I can't tell you which of these various things are helping. I think they all are. I think they're all pieces of the puzzle, right? One thing I can see is it does seem as if the holistic approach seems to be minimizing not just autism, but all types of chronic conditions from ear infections and 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 uh, and allergies and asthma and autoimmune diseases and cancers. And not to say that we never see them because we do, but just compared to what I'm hearing from my colleagues in the national numbers, we do seem to be making a difference. And so that's our silver lining. So I'm sure I gave you some food for thought. Um, let us know what you think about it. I'll make leave comments in the, in the uh, down below. We love to hear what you have to say. Have a great day.